Welcome to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast from Iowa's leading agricultural news source. Brought to you by the Iowa Farm Bureau. Now, here's your host. Welcome to the September 21st edition of The Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and today's episode features interviews with Iowa Farm Bureau President Craig Hill and Iowa State grain quality expert Dr. Charles Herberg. President Hill is going to cover the highlights from Iowa Farm Bureau's recent Summer Policy Conference, an annual event that brings together county farm bureaus from around the state to set the organization's public policy direction for the coming year. And Dr. Herberg will share tips for farmers who are trying to harvest and store grain that was damaged by Iowa's derecho, or drought, during the 2020 growing season. We start with President Hill sharing highlights from the Farm Bureau's two-day policy conference, which was earlier this month. Spokesman writer Tom Block has the story. Craig, every year the Summer Policy Conference starts off with a speech from the Iowa Farm Bureau president to the voting delegates and Farm Bureau members. With so much happening in today's world, both on and off the farm, what message did you want to express to our members? Well, you know, that message needs to be one of hope. We've had a number of disasters confronting the state, our farmers, agriculture. We had uh, severe floods, if you recall, a year ago. A lot of trade uncertainty, uncertainty around the RFS and what uh, the future held for biofuels. As we went into 2020, we absolutely uh, didn't consider a global pandemic uh, hitting us as it has. And, And in March, travel was restricted. Of course, congregation of folks coming together was uh, restricted. A lot of things changed. Our food supply system changed uh, drastically. We saw enormous adjustments that needed to be made by folks and our businesses. And through all of this crisis, coupled with a derecho this summer, coupled with a drought that persisted for a number of months and ended up taking about 80% of Iowa's uh, counties into some form of drought. With all of this, uh, the reaction of folks in Iowa, our farmers, uh, the reaction of agriculture has been remarkable. Uh, We've stepped up, we've helped one another, uh, we've looked out after one another, we've adjusted as as best as we could with the circumstances that have been put in front of us. The psyche of the farmer, I just have been amazed how strong that psyche has remained with all the hardship that we've had. And so I just wanted to express a little pride in our state and our farmers and what we've done in the face of all of this uh, difficult and hardship and unprecedented times. And the conference looked a little different this year with some social distancing measures in place. But as always, the County Farm Bureau voting delegates had a lot of discussion on several important ag policy issues. What are your thoughts on how this year's conference went and this year's policy development process as a whole? You know, something that's just so impressive, Tom, is the grassroots-led nature of this organization. And we look forward to every member in this organization offering an opinion and offering issues that, that they may surface that are important to them. And we'll put those together and and we'll study, uh, we'll research, we'll bring a resolutions committee together to dig deep into the issues. Every county farm bureau has an opportunity to discuss issues. We bring a delegate to Des Moines here for a two-day conference that they can debate and discuss and arrive at a consensus opinion on local, state, and national issues. And uh, it's really rather remarkable when you think of an organization, the extent that we go to get that member-driven, grassroots-led opinion on what we should be advocating. And so to witness this is is really uh, quite remarkable. It gives us a, a sense of comfort, if you will, to know we're doing the right thing for our members. And now we'll get into some of the meat of the issues. What were some of the key issues discussed over the two-day conference? Well, as you know, Tom, we had historic reductions in the values paid to livestock producers, both cattle and hog producers, uh, and many other species as well as a result of the COVID disaster. But at the same time, we witnessed increases to what consumers were paying for meat, protein products. Uh, and it was uh, a, a situation where farmers just felt violated 
Uh, they'd worked so hard, they'd done such a great job in the production, but the supply chain broke down. And it was uh, dramatic. It brought into uh, our concerns about fairness, but it also brought in concerns about the future, whether it'd be able to survive as a livestock producer going forward with the kind of losses that we were witnessing. So uh, in this two-day session, farmers talked about livestock mandatory reporting of prices and is it working for producers? We only have four packers that control over 80% of our cattle processing. So access to competitive markets and open markets was a big concern. We need robust price discovery and we need a system that's transparent and available to everyone. Uh, so wherever you're producing cattle, you should be able to have access to reliable market pricing information. All sales are reported and should be reported and we should have access. So we've set out a policy goal of nationally uh, for 50% of our cattle to be purchased on a negotiated basis and that uh, should be of competitive buyers and uh, help also for uh, our small packers, our small processors in our local communities that are working hard every day to assist us in, in uh, providing that wholesome uh, protein to uh, consumers. So a number of ways that we can work to extend and build the capacity of the processing, but also the fairness uh, in the pricing that's delivered to farmers. One of the other big issues that's always important to farmers is biofuels. There was some language adopted on pump labeling and the need to continue the RFS. Why is that so important? Well, again, Tom, access to markets plays an incredible role in biofuel policy as well. And we want to continue it with the spirit of the RFS, the Renewable Fuel Standard. In Iowa, uh, our efforts are around, are around clean air and uh, octane enhancement and, and helping these fuels become biofuel replacement of petroleum. So we're going to ask for a 10% uh, ethanol blend uh, mandated in every station across the state. And we think we can lead. Maybe other states will follow as well. So a leadership role there in a 10% blend across the board. But homegrown fuels play a key role in moving away from petroleum, uh, enhancing air quality, and our energy security going forward. Livestock biosecurity is always an issue. There was some policy on African swine fever um, and the importance of keeping our herd protected. We have a state vet, and our state vet should have the authority to uh, work to eliminate feral swine. Uh, the magnitude of the problem is uh, concerning because we are the number one pork producing state in the country. Uh, we produce over a third of the nation's pork. And so if feral swine would uh, provide for a disease outbreak here in this state, it would be crippling uh, to the industry. So um, we're just really pleased that we're able to give some authority to the state vet so that we can eliminate any feral swine that may appear. And one final issue that I'd like to talk about, local foods. There was some policy discussed on giving farmers the opportunity to sell local foods and also for local processors you know, to have the opportunity to start up and maybe some incentives and, you know, the innovation that our farmers and our small towns are showing in this respect. Certainly. And, you know, we'll never give up on food safety. We'll never put in question the food safety concerns. But to streamline the process, I think, is important and have a state run and state uh, controlled certification program so that the best authorities can make decisions on what's prudent and what's not and it's uh, available to everyone statewide so we all have a uniform standard that we're working for both in meat processing but also in local food sales and so uh, we look forward to that and we think that uh, a uniform streamlined state permitting process for local foods is the way to go and uh, so we'll be working toward that end. Well, Craig, as you mentioned earlier, these resolutions are divided into the state level and the national level. So what's the next step? Where do we go from here? Tom, the goals of Farm Bureau are always to seek a unified, united effort in our goals and ambitions. And so the state resolutions uh, we will work to implement now, but we need to go on to the American Farm Bureau in January and convince and advocate for the goals that, that Iowans have. 
uh, to get into the national policy goals of the American Farm Bureau. And so we'll work to do that and prepare for that. And if successful, we'll have the united efforts of the American Farm Bureau behind us in these national goals. And that's what it takes to, to really get things done. Okay, Craig, thanks for joining us today. Anything else you'd like to add to wrap up? You know, I think another thing that was important to all of us is, is crop insurance. And uh, crop insurance the last several years has played an instrumental role in the survival of our farmers. The floods of uh, 2019 and the drought of 2020 as long with the, the derecho winds. So when you are in a situation where you are going to have to prevent plant or not be able to uh, get that crop put in the ground, there is a pricing system in the crop insurance that has a spring price and a fall price. Uh, most producers have the choice of taking the higher of the two prices and we think that uh, we should be availed of that option of the higher of the two prices in the case of a prevent plant situation and so we'll be asking that from the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation going forward. It's definitely a challenging to-do list but that's why you have an organization like Farm Bureau. We're honored to serve as the united, grassroots voice of Iowa agriculture, working on the public policy issues that directly impact your farm. Of course, we know you have a lot more than farm policy on your mind right now, especially if you happen to be harvesting and trying to store crops damaged by Iowa's derecho or the drought. On that topic, we bring in Dr. Charles Herberg, a grain quality expert at Iowa State University. Spokesman editor Dirk Steimel has the story. We're here with Charles Herberg, Iowa State University grain quality expert and director of the Iowa Grain Quality Initiative to discuss issues surrounding grain quality and storage in crops harvested from fields damaged by the ongoing drought and the August 10th derecho. Charlie, what are likely to be the biggest grain quality issues for farmers whose crops were damaged by one or both of these two big weather events? Well, let's look at the drought first. That's going to make smaller kernels, weaker stalks, and we hope we won't run into it, but drought always brings on the potential or mold in the field and the creation of mycotoxins, specifically aflatoxin. Test weight and protein will probably be reasonably normal because the corn died slowly during the drought. On the other hand, the reco storm basically killed the crop as it flattened it in the field or, or, or tangled it, basically killed it uh, at just into dent stage, which will make for low test weight, very low in some cases, 45 pounds and down, poor storability, very poor storability, probably low protein, and probably difficult to harvest, both from a downed grain perspective and from a soft kernels perspective. Lots of fines will probably uh, end up. Both of them will lead to some challenges in insurance crop adjustment, and that will have to be a very careful process. Quality is an insurable peril. Toxins are an insurable peril, and it will be very important to work carefully between the crop adjustment, the farmer, and the grain elevator, or whoever the grain is going to go to, to end up with, a, with an accurate settlement. How can farmers determine if they are facing a grain quality problem that's been caused by the weather or, or other factors? Well, first of all, we had a great start, which is kind of the sad part of this. Middle June, we were looking at probably one of the best starts and crops we'd ever had with excellent planting conditions. The issue with fall was looking like it was going to be not enough storage more than anything else. And that turned around quite a bit. The deterioration in quality was almost exclusively climate and environment based, both with the drought and then with the 75 mile by 300 mile strip that got chopped up by the, by the storm. Fortunately, all of the quality factors that this environment deteriorated 
Fortunately, all of them can be built in uh, if they decrease value into the crop insurance. But if you're in those areas, drought or the storm uh, area, you can pretty much assume that quality and storability will probably be deteriorated as well as yield. If they haven't started combining already, are there steps that farmers in those areas can take before they begin harvesting? Yeah, yes, there are. Um, I mean, I hate to say the same thing over again, but it's true. The first thing, the first person that needs to get involved is crop insurance and 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 crop insurance adjustment. Uh, scout the fields before harvest. I can all I, I can scouting corn that's flat on the ground may sound like you know, kind of an anti-climax, but what we're looking for in both cases, the drought area and the downed corn area, we're looking for the development of mold in the field that could subsequently either create mycotoxins or be a storage risk if held too dry and too warm going down the road. And everyone needs to understand that that on the on the insurance side, quality cannot be adjusted in the bin. It is adjusted before it gets put into storage wherever it is, rather than an elevator or on farm. Quantity, the pounds or the bushels, that can be measured or weighed at future times. But but the quality has to be settled on as the grain comes out of the field. After the crop is harvested, are there signals of quality deterioration that farmers should look for when they put their corn or, or soybeans into the bin? Uh, yes, there are. If this stressed grain is dried slowly or held too long, wet before drying, chances are we will see mold development, maybe even continued mold development of the field fungi that create toxins. So we want to get it dry and cool and also clean. Uh, it will be very important to take the center course out of bins because this softer grain, lower test weight grain, is going to break up. We will have a lot of fines in the grain. Going forward, I would say we'll have to check the grain more frequently. It will want to heat. Test weights below 54 pounds start to decrease the storage life. And if we have test weights in the low 50s or 40s even, the storage life will be quite short. So, so monitoring will be very important. One day you may not see mold growth, the next day you might. So maintaining the corn cold and consistent will be will pay a real premium this year. What steps should farmers take before feeding grains harvested from these storm damaged uh, fields to livestock, Charlie? That's a very good question because a lot of this corn, even if it has been adjusted out, by the crop insurance process may have feed value, but a lot of it will have, but even the, the worst of it may have feed value, particularly for cattle. And it, it will be important to essentially know what you have. Uh, if you're going to feed the stressed corn, either drought stressed or corn that, that lay on the ground because it was broken off or leaned over, it will be important to know what you have. Work with your veterinarian and get good samples sent for analysis before you start to use it. Analysis means a mycotoxin evaluation, that's the products, it could be possible products of the mold development. Test weight simply because some smaller animals will eat by volume and test weight will carry through into the volume required for the feed products. And then finally, protein and oil, because that represents nutrition and energy. Uh, Get some good tests done. Veterinarians have access to laboratories, and I have to put a plug in here. Uh, Veterinarians have access to laboratories at Iowa State, the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, who can give back test results for all of those things and allow the veterinarian to work with that producer to use the grain correctly, that is, blend with, with it whatever is necessary to make sure it's not uh, over limits for toxins or under protein or, or, or some other hazard. A lot of grain storage bins, both on farm and uh, commercial ones, were damaged or destroyed during the derecho. 
Will that put more pressure on farmers to find adequate storage this year? The short answer to that is is yes, because in local situations with an entire set of bins flattened, then there will be a storage problem at that point. Uh, we think about 60 million bushels capacity of commercial elevators was lost, and maybe about that same amount more in um, in, in on-farm storage uh, bins were lost. At 120 to maybe 150 million bushels, that's less than the amount of grain that we think was taken out uh, by the storms and drought. So in the whole, there probably will not be a storage crunch, but that's little consolation for the farmer whose structure was completely destroyed or the elevator that was completely destroyed. What I think will happen for the most part is that the commercial system will have to put in a little more trucking. It will be hauled to locations that, that didn't get storm damaged and, and stored, in other, stored in other places, which of course will add some trucking costs to it. This year's grain is not very suited to outdoor piling it's not doesn't have that great of storage property, so that will be short-lived at best uh, for the grain to stay in condition. I don't advocate farmers making piles of their own on the farm. Small piles go out of condition faster than big ones, and the management at a commercial elevator is daily. It might be tough to, to do grain pile management daily in an on-farm situation. Some people are probably going to try the silo bags, the bag storage that is filled and, and then left either at the end of the field or in the farmyard. That will work, but the silo bag technology, which is widely used worldwide, is primarily relying on dry grain in the case of corn and soybeans, particularly corn. And Maybe we'll have grain below 15% moisture coming out of the field, and maybe not. Uh, with wetter grain, there's not the capability to, to aerate and uh, control the movement of moisture. So the silo bag is effective if the grain is dry enough, uh, not so much if the grain is swept. I think the primary impact will be that the uh, Probably more grain will go to the elevator. A greater percentage of the of farmer's grain will, will go to the elevator if storage is lost, and then it will be spread out among other locations. Switching gears a bit, uh, we know that grain bin safety is a perennial concern here in Iowa. What are some steps that farmers can take to reduce the potential for accidents when loading, unloading, or checking grain bins, Charlie? Well, first, this year is probably going to be a high frustration year because of all the down grain and then, frankly, the, the reduced yield and maybe not the best price uh, along with it. I think that the frustration level will be pretty high. And that's what makes for shortcuts and I don't want to say carelessness, but maybe not doing everything, you taking all the steps you might do and getting caught in augers, in handling equipment, in corn heads, etc. Patience is, I think the most important factor for safety this year is going to be patience. But to your question on grain bins, the statistics for years on grain engulfments, there's problems with, with getting trapped in bins, Statistics for years have shown that those incidents go up sharply with reduced quality. And that reduced quality here means not doesn't flow well, hangs up in the bins. We probably will have two factors that will cause that. One, higher moisture, and two, lower test weight. That's going to make less flowable grain. There's no doubt about that. So the entry into bins should never be alone, never be with anything operating at the bottom, taking out grain. The, the risk of, of bridging 
is going to be pretty high this year. Bridging meaning the grain will run out from under the pile with a break or an airspace that will cave in later on. Bin entry should never be attempted alone and without safety equipment to provide a way out or a rope to uh, provide a way to prevent you from getting trapped. So I think this year will be one to take a lot more time and precautions in both the filling and the checking of bins. It's going to be a challenging year. We're going to have more storage problems, uh, more grain breakage and fines problems, more, I would say, frustrations over the crop insurance and price and those, those marketing issues. This is a year to take your time and not get overly intense about harvest. We do have an, a fairly early start, uh, which is a good thing. So everybody, please stay safe. We appreciate that advice from Dr. Herberg. And if you're a regular Spokesman Speaks podcast listener, you know that we also had Iowa State crop expert Dr. Mark Licht on the podcast a couple of weeks ago to share his tips for managing storm-damaged crops. That's back in episode 50. We've included a link to that episode in the notes for today's episode, so you can easily go back and listen to that if you'd like. I also want to bring your attention to a webinar we recently recorded with Emily Kreckelberg, who's a farm safety and health expert for the University of Minnesota. It's no secret that harvest is a particularly stressful time that introduces unique safety risks, and no one has a better understanding of those risks than Emily. Emily has lived through the devastating experience of having two family members who have lost limbs in agricultural accidents. So she brings us advice and perspective that's not only based in research, it comes from a place of personal experience. So I'd encourage you to squeeze in some time to view her recorded webinar, which is also linked to this podcast episode. We'll also have Emily on our podcast in an upcoming episode, so make sure you're subscribed to the Spokesman Speaks podcast in your favorite podcast app to catch that conversation and other future interviews. With that, we'll wrap up this episode of the podcast. I hope that your 2020 harvest is off to a safe and productive start, and I hope that you'll keep our podcast handy for more expert interviews and insights as the season progresses. Thank you for bringing in the harvest that sustains all of us, and thanks for listening to the Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcasts and articles from The Spokesman at iowafarmbureau.com slash spokesman. You can also find and subscribe to The Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Play, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews and welcome your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.